This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell about another exciting adventure he shared with that master detective, his old friend Sherlock Holmes. And say, I want to tell you about a little present I've got for you. Uh Uh-huh, a present and it's free. It's a swell recipe calendar printed in full color, and it's good for two years, 1945 and 46. But best of all, this calendar not only gives you the dates, it gives you loads of swell recipes and ideas for cooking with Petri wine. Want to know how to make spare ribs that are out of this world? You want to learn a new way to fix liver and onions, a swell way to make soup more delicious than ever. It's a cinch with this calendar handy in your kitchen to tell you how. In fact, this calendar tells you all you ought to know about wine. And remember, it's free. Just write to Petri Wine, P-E-T-R-I, Petri Wine, San Francisco 26, California. Petri Wine, San Francisco 26, California. We'll send you your swell recipe calendar immediately. And now for our weekly visit with the genial Dr. Watson. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Foreman. Come in and settle yourself down. Thank you. You're looking particularly comfortable tonight, Doctor. Feet up on the sofa and the puppies asleep on your lap. Yes, my boy. The three of us went for a long walk on the beach this afternoon. Monty and Winnie had a running battle with the seagulls. In consequence, they've been fast asleep ever since we got home. Oh, I hope you're not too tired, Doctor. I'm counting on a new Sherlock Holmes story, you know. No, no, no. I'm all ready for you, Mr. Foreman. In fact... I was going through my notes on the case just before you arrived. Well, last week you told us it concerned a strange society who held their meetings in an underground vault of a furniture warehouse. Yeah, that's right, my boy. Now, down, Winnie. Uh, get down, Monty. No, 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 no. <laughs> down, 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 down. The story really began one stormy November night in 1887. I was married at the time and living away from Baker Street. On this night in question, my wife had already gone to bed and I was nodding in front of the fire over one of Clark Russell's fine sea stories. I'd had a very tiring day, I remember. It was about the hour that a man gives his first yawn and glances at the clock, when suddenly my front doorbell jangled discordantly. Oh, our servant Edna had gone up to bed, so I crossed to the window and opened it. It was uh, very dark. But I could just see the outline of a figure standing on my doorstep. It looked like a woman. Suddenly, a a cultivated voice called up to me. Is the doctor in? Uh, uh, Yes, madam. Uh, I'm the doctor. Then please come at once. It's a matter of life and death. I have a carriage waiting. Gracious me. Uh, All right, all right. I'll I'll be down immediately. I closed the window, scribbled a note to my wife, grabbed my coat and hat and my bag, and a few minutes later, I stepped out of the front door... And closed it behind me. The carriage was standing at the curb, but I couldn't see any trace of the lady who'd called me. The only person in sight was an old and repulsive looker bigger woman, dressed in rags and tatters. After a moment of bewilderment, I spoke. Uh, my, my good woman, did you see a lady leave here a moment ago? No, Doctor, she didn't leave. She's still waiting for you. Oh, oh. oh forgive me, madam, but. Uh... <laughs> Those are yours. I, I, I thought you were a beggar woman. There isn't any time to discuss that now. Please get in this carriage. Mm-hmm. But uh, where, where's the driver? I'm going to drive. Please get in. Oh, very well, very well. It's only business. Uh, are you sure that you can handle those horses, madam? Of course I can. Well, I wish you'd tell me the way you're, you're driving, ma'am. Please don't ask me any more questions, doctor. You'll find out soon enough. Thank heavens we've finally reached our destination. Must have driven halfway across London. Oh, hello, hello. Must be somewhere down near the river. No dwelling places here. 
nothing but enormous warehouses. Uh, why have we stopped here, madam? Well, this is where we're going. Please follow me down these steps. I wish you'd tell me where you're taking me. We have a, a club here in the basement. You'll see for yourself in a moment. It's hmm. a very solid-looking door. How do you propose to get past it? I'll show you. Lord, it must be a very secret club of yours, madam. It is, Doctor. Who knocks? Number seven. Give the password. To the lanterns. You may enter. Follow me, Doctor. Madam, I do wish you'd tell me where you're taking me. This looks like the entrance to an opium den or a, a thieves' kitchen. Don't worry, Doctor. You're in no danger. There. Did that look like a thieves' kitchen? Great Scott, I don't believe my eyes. A luxuriously furnished room. What a strange collection of people. Some look like beggars. Others in full evening dress. Amazing. Uh, number seven. Who is this man? He's a doctor. I went to fetch him. I thought I said there would be no strangers inside Now, look here, here, my good man. I've been extremely patient, but my temper's beginning to wear a little thin. Either let me see your patient at once or show me out. My time's valuable and I don't propose to waste it. I'm sorry, doctor. Where is Julian? He's in the back room. And if you know what's good for you, doctor, whatever you call yourself, no. you'll forget everything you see in here. Stop threatening me, sir. I'm not the least interested in your blasted club. Just take me to the patient. This is the man we want you to examine, Doctor. No? What happened? He fell down the stairs leading into the club room. Well, why'd you move him? We wanted him to be comfortable. It's the worst thing in the world you could have done. Never never move a person with an injured skull. Is he... Is he going to be all right, Doctor? No, madam, I'm afraid he isn't. His neck's broken. He's dead. Huh? Julian, dead. You sure of that, Doctor? Of course I'm sure of it, my good man. I'm afraid you need an undertaker, not a doctor. We must tell the others. All right, quiet, everybody. Quiet. Quiet. Julian is dead. Julian? Julian dead? Oh, this is terrible. Who is this man? He's a doctor. We'd better get him out of here at once. We don't want any strangers nosing about. That's right. You shouldn't have brought him here anyway. Now, just a minute, just a minute. I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, I have the slightest desire to stay here one moment longer. If you direct me to the door again, madam, I'll try to find a cab myself in this godforsaken district and go home. Show him out and give him his money. Follow me, please. I'm delighted to. Do you mind if I don't drive you home, doctor? Oh, well, uh, no, I should prefer it. My nerves aren't uh, in the best of shape. You mustn't be angry with me, doctor, please. Leaving again, number seven. No, but this gentleman is. Will you see if you can find a cab for him? Right. To whom shall I send in my bill, madam? Oh, here's a five-pound note. That should cover your time and trouble, shouldn't it? No, 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 no. It's, it's far too much, madam. No, doctor. Five it's five late at night and it hasn't been a very pleasant case for you. Please take it. Oh, it's very kind of you. Very generous indeed. But by the way, uh, uh, how did you happen to, to come to me in, in the first place? Well, I was driving about looking for a doctor and a policeman directed me to your house. Oh, I see. I have found a cab for you. Well, thank you, my man. Thank you. Oh, doctor. May I come round in the morning... For a death certificate. Of course, of course. You remember my address? Yes, but I don't know your name. Uh, Watson. Uh, Dr. Watson. Dr. Watson? Not... Not the Dr. Watson who's associated with Sherlock Holmes. Oh, right, madam. I'm flattered that you know of me. <laughs> Good night, Doctor. And please forget about everything you've seen. So, what an amazing business. Holmes will be interested to hear about this. (laughs) 
And that's the way it was, Holmes. One of the most curious adventures I ever had without you. Very interesting, Watson. You say this underground cellar was luxuriously mm. furnished. Yes, and the people there were an amazing mixture. Some were in rags and some in evening dress. Huh, like the nursery rhyme, eh? Some in rags and some in tags and some in velvet gowns. Oh, exactly. Give me the feeling that I was taking part in a story out of the Arabian Nights. I must say, though, I was pretty angry at the time. However, after a good night's rest, I, I feel quite differently this morning. I thought I'd just drop round and tell you all about it. Glad you did, my dear fellow. It would be interesting to see if any repercussions of your strange adventure reach us. Oh, I doubt it. The woman seemed frightened to death when I mentioned your name. We shall see. Meanwhile, I'm expecting a client. You're not too busy. Perhaps you can stay. No, I'd like to very much. Uh, who is it? You the know? telegram will tell you much more than I can. It arrived an hour ago. Let's have a look. Be at your lodgings this morning to discuss our problem. Signed, AMS. <laughs> Pretty high-handed message. Be at your lodgings. Oh, please. <laughs> what do you suppose AMS stands for? I was just toying with that problem when you arrived. Could it be the uh, American Medical School? No, no, there's no such body. It's the American Medical Association. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Of the imperious yes, yes. Uh, tone of the message inclines me to believe that the A stands for amateur. Very possibly. Amateur Masker Society. Or uh, the Amateur Murderers. <laughs> that, uh, that would be a nice thought, wouldn't it? Mm. Ah. That is their representative now, no doubt, to save us further guesswork. Holmes, it looks like the same carriage as I drove in last night. The girl standing on your doorstep dressed in the height of fashion. Mrs. Hudson turning her in. Splendid. It seems that we have not heard the end of your adventure. Go and meet the lady at the top of the stairs, will you, Walsh? Up and save Mrs. Hudson's legs. Right, you are, Holmes. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Thank you. All right, uh, come in, madam. Want to come in? Thank you, Dr. Watson. Mrs. Sherlock Holmes. At your service, madam. Won't you, uh, won't you sit down? I'm Lady Dorothy Brownlee. It's your voice. You're the lady who fetched me last night, uh... Dressed up as, as a bigger woman. Yes, I am, Dr. Watson. Forgive me for being so mysterious at the time. <laughs> Doubtless you have come to consult me regarding last night's unfortunate accident at the Amateur Mendicant Society. How did you know what the initials stood for, Mr. Holmes? Well, after hearing Dr. Watson's story of last night's happenings, the uh, connotation seemed obvious. Am I right? Perfectly. Mm -hmm. Last night, when Dr. Watson told us Julian was dead, we thought it was an accident. And now you think it is a uh, murder, eh? Lady Bromley... If you expect my help, there must be no more mystery. Just what is this amateur mendicant society? Well, I'm afraid it'll be a little hard for you to understand our motives. We're a group of people, rather wealthy people, I suppose, who find pleasure in deliberately leading a seamy life disguised as beggars. We use the basement that you were in last night, Doctor, as our headquarters. We keep our beggars clothes there and change out of them before we go home. Mm, what a fantastic idea. What a futile, worthless way of spending your leisure time, Lady Brownlee. I suppose <laughs> it must seem so, Mr. Holmes. But we're curious to learn how the other half lives. Mm -hmm. and of course, there's a certain thrill in rubbing shoulders with the police. At least we do some good. Indeed. I should be interested to learn how. All well, the money we make as beggars, we give to charity. Oh, do you really? And you feel that this gesture on your part absolves you from any responsibility to the real beggars whose livelihood you are impairing. I hadn't thought of it just like that. No. Then I suppose you won't want to help us. Oh, that's quite another matter, madam. As a professional detective, I cannot afford to be a moralist. Yes, I will investigate this case for you, though I warn you my fee will be an extremely high one. Money isn't important, Mr. Holmes, as long as we can solve Julian's death without bringing the police into the case. Lady Brownlee... Who is the dead man? The man you refer to as Julian? Julian Trapper, the poet. Oh, he was yes. the one who started our society. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think I've read some of his work. Decadent. Distinctly decadent. Well, what makes you think that he was murdered, Lady Brown? Well, after you left last night, Dr. Watson, there was a terrible scene. You remember Sidney Holt? Oh, was he the big fellow who was so unpleasant to huh? Yes, that's the one. Oh, do I remember him? <laughs> he said that he saw Lord Cecil deliberately trip Julian as he came to the head of the staircase. Oh, Lord Cecil being, uh... Lord Cecil Dierenforth, son of the Earl of Mersham. Oh, yes. There was a bitter argument. Cecil accused Sidney of doing the same thing. Then they had a dreadful fight. And it ended up with Cecil threatening to go to the police. So that's when we decided to send a telegram to you, Mr. Holmes. Oh, yes, yes, I see. So the proof of murder depends on such flimsy evidence as to whether the dead man fell or, well, should we say, uh, 
was pushed. <laughs> It seems like... Mr. Holmes, even though you don't approve, please help us, won't you? Yes, Lady Brownlee, I will. Then you come back with me now to our headquarters. I shall join you within the hour. In the meantime, my old friend Dr. Watson can go with you. But Holmes, what can I do without you? You know my methods, old chap. Act accordingly. Oh, very well, Mr. Holmes. But you promise you'll be there. I promise you that I will be there, madam. Thank you so much, Mr. Holmes. We'll be expecting you. Come on, Doctor. Well, I'll, I'll just get my hat and coat. Holmes, what are you up to? Go with her and ask no more questions. I shall join you within the hour. Holmes, there's a glint in your eye. I don't think you, you believe her story. Of course I don't, Watson. Well, then what? Then go with her, old fellow, and keep your wits about you. The game's afoot. The story of the Amateur Mendicant Society will continue in just a few seconds. Time I'd like to use to remind you that you're really missing something until you try having wine with your dinner. And I mean a Petri wine. Let's say a Petri California Burgundy or a Petri California Sauterne. Both wines are just made to make good food taste better. If you like a red wine, try Petri Burgundy. Try it with hamburger, with stew, with any meat or meat dish. And if you like a delicious white wine, a wine that'll make chicken taste better than ever, try a well-chilled Petri Sauterne. With food... Nothing can take the place of a good Petri wine. And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. The Amateur Mendicant Society, a group of wealthy eccentrics who pose as beggars, have come to Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson with a problem. One of their members has apparently been murdered, and the famous pair have been asked to investigate the killing. As we rejoin our story, Dr. Watson, still awaiting the arrival of the great detective, is cross-questioning three of the members at the headquarters of this unusual society. I'm afraid that I don't find your stories very convincing. Oh, don't you now? Well, then suppose you stop asking questions until Sherlock Holmes gets here. He's the man we've engaged to settle this business, not you. We're paying for his services, not those of his assistant. Uh, Mr. Holmes asked me to conduct this preliminary investigation, my good man. I'm perfectly familiar with his methods. So keep a civil tongue in your head if you want us to continue with this case. Well, I'm not answering any more questions till he gets here. Insufferable fuller. Uh, Lord Cecil, you say that you saw Holt deliberately trip the dead man as he came down the stairs last night. Yes, I did. Well, uh, where were you standing, sir? At the head of the staircase. Holt was beside me, and as Julian came by, he deliberately... Excuse me, please. Excuse me, number 11. Excuse uh, me. What is it? There is a strange man just come in. He is dressed as you when you work. But I do not remember to have seen him here before. He speaks very rough. Mm. Did he give the correct signal? Yes, and the password. He must be a new member. I suppose we better see him. Bring him in. Oh, bad time for him to come here. Come on. This way, please. Tommy. What a nice place you got here. Yeah, what a nice place. Certainly do yourself proud, don't you? Who are you, and how did you get in here? I'll give you a signal and the password, just like Julian told me to. Uh, are you a friend of Julian? Of course I am. You told me to meet him here to die. Who are you, really? Are we all friends here? Yes, you can talk freely. And permit me to introduce myself. I am Don Luis Jose Fernando de las Torres at your service. Why? Why do you want to join us? When Julian tell me about it, uh, well, it uh, tickled my, how you say, uh, my funny bone. <laughs> it is a so charming idea. I just see another was of mendicancy. Huh. I suppose he's all right. Of course I'm all right. Now, where is Julian, please? He will uh, vouch for me. He's in the other room. That an accident. An accident? Not a bad one, I hope. A very bad one. Dr. Watson, you better take him in there and break the news to him. Uh, well, well uh, follow me, sir. This is terrible. Please, tell me what happened, Doctor. I'm afraid you must prepare yourself for a shock, sir. Your friend is dead. Dead? His neck was broken last night in some brawl. Yes, except that I do believe it was an accident, Watson. Holmes! Quiet, old chap, quiet. But not quietly enough, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Come on, come back to the others and let all take a look at you. Come on, get moving, both of you. This isn't a pop gun in my hands. Oh, sorry, Holmes, I gave the whole thing away. That's all right, old chap. Oh, Cecil, Dorothy, yes. come here. I want you to take a look at the great Sherlock Holmes. Walked into our trap just like any stupid policeman. No, I had to dress up to do it, though, Mr. Holmes. We were waiting for you here anyway, you know. Oh, I was well aware of that, Mr. Holt. You see, I knew I was walking into a trap. 
How did you know that, Mr. Holmes? Lady Brownlee, the story you brought to us today was so obviously a false one. Just as there is no amateur mendicant society. Who are they, Holmes? Go ahead, Mr. Holmes. Tell him. Let's see how much you really do now. Yes, go ahead. Why should I tell you what you already know? Go on, talk, if you know what's good for you. Oh, you're so persuasive, aren't you, Mr. Holt? Very well. Undoubtedly, Julian Trevor's death last night was an accident. You fetched the doctor, Lady Brownlee, a very natural move, and later discovered that the doctor in question was the old friend of Sherlock Holmes. Mm. You were all afraid that I would become interested in your unusual society, and so you invented that very thin story about the accident being a murder. You wanted to lure me here so that I could be disposed of, and you could all continue your nefarious works without hindrance. Well, now aren't we clever? What is our nefarious work, may I ask? Your password gave me a clue to the lanterns. Try the French revolutionists. They strung the aristocrats up on the lampposts. Then again, the combination of curious costumes and a luxurious establishment in a low-class area posed another question. What political belief provides... A common meeting ground for misguided aristocrats and dangerous commoners. And how did you answer that question? Oh, very simple, my dear sir. One word. Nihilism. It's doctrine of assassination and overthrow of government to find every chance of being put into practice by all of you at the forthcoming jubilee celebrations to be held here in London. And also would account uh, for your beggar's clothes. A beggar would have greater freedom of movement in a crowd than an ordinary person. You're a clever man, Mr. Holmes. Too bad you'll have to die. I'll get the rope. What are you going to do with him? Do? Give him a first-hand taste of nihilism, of course. They can't live. They know too much. Well, you can't possibly do this, you know. The police will track us here. By the time the police get here, you and your friend Holmes will be blown to kingdom come. Here's the rope, Sidney. All right. Hands together, Mr. Holmes. That's it. Ah! Oh, mind that bandit wrist of mine, will you? It's confoundedly sore. Oh, isn't that a shame now? Is this any better? Ooh. Tie up the doctor, Cecil, while I bind Holmes' legs. With pleasure. I can't go through with this. What do you mean, Dorothy? You can't go through with it. I just can't stand by and see two innocent men murdered. Now don't be a fool, Dorothy. We can't let them live. They know too much. I don't care. If you go on with this, I'm going out for the police. Are you fool. No. Tie her up as well, Cecil. Leave me alone. Sit down there beside him. Go on. <laughs> You're a devil, Sidney. Oh, shut up. Now, Mr. Holmes, I'm going to fetch a little invention. A little invention I'm sure you'll be interested in. Mr. Holmes, it's a pity you and your friend didn't learn to mind your own business. I'm afraid it's too late to teach an old dog new tricks. It's too late now, at any rate. Quite comfortable, Dr. Watson? Don't you speak to me, sir. You're a filthy traitor to your country. Oh, rubbish. Here we are. Example of Mikhail Petrov's mechanical genius. This bomb will blow the entire building sky high. And the three of you with it. Now, I wind the time clock so... And we'll set the fuse to go off in in five minutes. It'll give us plenty of time to get away. So. Come on, Sidney, let's get out of here. Right. <laughs> Charming picture. Three of you bound hand and foot sitting beside each other on the sofa. <laughs> well, ta-da, Dorothy. Think of our cause during the five minutes. <laughs> and as for you, Mr. Holmes, and your friend, good riddance to bad rubbish. <laughs> well, Holmes, this looks like well, the end. Quite so, old chap. I blame myself. If I hadn't been so infernally noisy when I recognized you, we wouldn't be in this mess. Wasn't your fault, old fellow. I think they suspected me anyway. Well, I must say, it seemed to me that you told them a great deal more than was necessary about your suspicions. Surely you could have pretended ignorance. Oh, I suppose I could have done. I can't die yet. I'm not ready to courage, die. Courage, Brownlee, courage. And by the way, was I right in assuming that your associates are nihilists? Of course they are. They're planning to assassinate the Prime Minister during the Jubilee celebration. Prime Minister, great heavens, Holmes, we've got to get free. Assuming some miracle happened, and we did get free, and your former associates were arraigned in court, would you testify against them? Oh, of course I would. But what chance is there of that? Why doesn't it stop ticking? If it bothers you that much, Lady Brownlee, I'll stop it for you. Holmes, your hands are free. Of course they are, my dear fellow. The bandaged wrist I mentioned just now concealed a razor-edged blade. I cut through the ropes almost before our friends had left the room. Then why did you keep us in the suspense, Mr. Holmes? I wanted to be quite sure that you'd testify in the forthcoming trial, madam. There we are. That renders the bomb harmless. Ah! And that means that the police have sprung the trap that I set to your associates, Lady Brownlee. 
It's lucky for you that you uh, had a change of heart and prevented you from leaving us. Oh, Mr. Holmes, how could I ever thank you? Holmes, you had the place surrounded with police when you came in here. Of course I did, my dear fellow. Yeah, let me undo your ropes. No wonder you were so calm. <laughs> no wonder you told them so much. You wanted them to show their hands. Precisely, old fellow. And they obliged me most satisfactorily. They attempted our triple murder. They are self-confessed anarchists. And with the evidence of Lady Brownlee, I'm sure that we can put them where they all belong. Considering it's uh, barely noon, I think you'll agree, Watson... That is a very comprehensive morning's work. Doctor, tell the truth. Were you scared waiting for that time bomb to go off? Scared, my boy? I was so scared that to this day I can't stand being in the same room with a, a loud ticking clock. Each tick of the clock seems to speak to me. Seems to say... This is the end. Tick-tock. This is the end. The clock ever speak to you like that? Well, yes, Doctor. How did you know? Well, what's the clock say to you? Tick-tock. Petri took time to bring you good wine. Petri took time to bring you good oh, wine. Precious me, Mr. Foreman. You listen to your clock and I'll listen to mine. Gosh, Doctor, can I help it if I like to hear about Petri wine? After all, that Petri family really knows how to make good wine. And it's no wonder. They've been making wine ever since they started the Petri business generations ago, way back in the 1800s. And because the making of Petri wine is a family affair, well, they've been able to hand on down from father to son, from father to son, the skill and experience of each preceding generation. So naturally, when it comes to turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine, well... You just can't beat the Petri family because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And say, don't forget to take time to send for your Petri recipe calendar. It's free. Just write to Petri Wine, P-E-T-R-I, Petri Wine, San Francisco 26, California. San Francisco 26, California. This offer is intended to apply only in those states and other localities where its acceptance is permissible by law and regulation. And now, Dr. Watson, what adventure are you planning to tell us next week? Well, next week, Mr. Foreman, I'm going to tell you a story of old Vienna. The Vienna of sparkling lights, beautiful women, and lilting music. And of an extraordinary murder that takes place to the accompaniment of a Mozart sonata. Boy, that sounds like a thriller. I'll see you for sure next week. Oh, uh, oh just a minute. Before I go, Mr. Foreman, I want to urge every registered nurse listening in to get all the facts about the Army Nurse Corps. The army needs you, nurses, needs you desperately. They'll make you an officer at once and give you every chance to further your post-war careers. So if you're a registered nurse under 45, call at your local Red Cross chapter and get all the details. Or wire collect to the Surgeon General, U.S. Army, Washington, D.C. And if you can't qualify for the nurses' call, see if you can't get into essential civilian nursing so that you can release a nurse who does qualify. To do something about it first thing tomorrow, won't you? Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Five Orange Pips. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Meanwhile, don't forget to take advantage of our offer of a free recipe calendar. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, Pet, Petri. This is Bill Foreman saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>